Matt Family, Director of the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here. I'd like to welcome you all here. And I'd like to start first by to thank uh, the staff of the Neubauer Collegium. I mean, we, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for um, the efforts. So first, Carolyn Owenby has just joined us and runs our events program. And that's Carolyn. And Mark Sorkin also runs the major events in, in communications. And um, Bridget Baltum, there you are in the back, uh, works with all the faculty uh, who are uh, uh, participating in, 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 in research projects and the, um, it, it, as well uh, all of our, our visiting fellows. Uh, Jennifer Hellman is back there who keeps us solvent um, and runs the books. And Elspeth uh, Carruthers in the back is uh, uh, the executive director and, and really makes the, uh, really makes the, uh, the, the new power collecting work. Um, I'd also like to thank our students who are helping us. They'll be running mics at the end. Tian Tian and Katarina and Erin um, are, you know, stable presences, and, and the, that is the group um, that makes the Dubar Collegium what, what it is. Um, Joan Scott uh, is, I think, one of the great historians and political thinkers at work today. She is also one of the great feminist historians and political thinkers. And she is also recognized as such. So um, however doubtful and anxious we may be about our times, I think there is comfort to be taken in realizing that all three of those facts could be true at the same time and in our time. Um, it's clear from her writing that her creativity flows in part from a sense of frustration and dissatisfaction. In her 1999 classic, uh, Gender and the Politics of History, Professor Scott says that her recourse to theory was driven by, quote, my sense of frustration at the relatively limited impact women's history was having on historical studies generally, and my consequent need to understand why that was the case. She says that her motive is, avow quote, avowedly political to point out and change inequalities between women and men, unquote. That, that is for Scott to be political is to be efficacious. It cannot just be about politics. It must be a form of understanding that is itself efficacious in changing the inequalities that it comes to understand. Scott's frustration arose from the recognition that the relation between pointing out inequalities and changing them is wildly problematic. Why isn't it point out and thereby change? The thereby seems so easily to go missing. This problem led Professor Scott to rethink critically the basic categories and methods through which history and political thinking, and in particular feminist thinking, is done. She has, in effect, taken responsibility for a mode of thinking about the past, that is history. Um, and I suspect that the reason so many people are here uh, in this room today is that we who have been reading her over years are both thrilled and impressed with the honesty, bravery, bluntness, the insight, depth, and sheer thoughtfulness of her endeavor. Now, by the time she wrote The Fantasy of Feminist History, which was just over a decade after uh, Gender and Politics of History, the, that was in 1999, and The uh, Fantasy of Feminist History is 2011, her thoughts changed, but she's still dissatisfied. Although she continues to find the concept of gender uh, as she puts it, useful for thinking about the historical constitution of relationships between women and men, quote, I have never been entirely satisfied with my own formulations. And she continues, I am positively distressed, this is a quote, at the way in which gender has so often been emptied of its most radical implications, treated as a known referent instead of a way to get at meanings that are neither literal nor transparent. So I've looked for ways to more forcefully insist on its mutability, unquote. Again, going against the cliches of our time, she turned to psychoanalytic thinking for inspiration. Gender, she argues, should no longer be thought of as, quote, simply a social construction, a way of organizing social, economic, and political divisions along sexually differenti differentiated lines. Rather, as she puts it, it is a historically and culturally specific attempt to resolve a fundamentally irresolvable problem, the problem of sexual difference. That is, 
although there will be historical and cultural specificities, it's very important to investigate, um, it's also true that we can nevertheless see a repetition within human societies, again and again trying to assign meaning to a, an anxious restlessness that will push at, disrupt, and disconcert any attempt to fix meaning. As Professor Scott puts it, quote, gender is, in other words, not the assignment of roles to physically different bodies, but the attribution of meaning to something that always eludes definition. Now what, and this is continuing from her, what psychoanalysis helps, illu helps illuminate is the ultimate unknowability of sexual difference and the nature of the quest for knowledge of it by way of fantasy identification and projection. The vertigo that ensues for the historian deprives her of certainty of her categories of analysis and leaves her searching only for the right questions to ask." Unquote. I'm struck by a similar restlessness in Freud's thought. On the one hand, he insists that human sexuality is at the core of human being, but on the other hand, he repeatedly insists that he cannot figure out what human sexuality is. In his early essay on the subject in 1905, he speculates that, as he puts it, in itself, the drive is without quality, but, quote, is only to be regarded as a demand made upon the mind for work, unquote. To put it in contemporary language, the sexual drive itself has no fixed meaning, but is an anxious pressure in relationship to which the mind gets busy. And the mind gets busy with fantasies, collective and personal, that Freud and Scott both think need to be understood if we are to understand ourselves. And two decades later, in a footnote to that very passage, Freud adds, the, quote, the theory of the drives is the most important, but at the same time, the least complete portion of psychoanalytic theory, unquote. And he insisted on the unknowability of his theory throughout his career. Now, uh, as yet, uh, you know, yet, uh, um, and I think in Professor Scott work, Scott's work, this inability to fix meaning turns out to be an enormous source of creativity. It is as though what first like, looked like a problem we cannot fix a meaning, turns out to be the beginnings of a solution. There is no fixed meaning. Now, Professor Scott's most recent book, Sex and Secularism, and it turns out it's just published. I think the official publication date is uh, November 9th, but here's a real thing. It's a living <laughs> copy of it, and I got to read it over the past two days, but it's hot off the press. This recent book, Sex, Sex and Secularism, puts her decades of theoretical thinking into practice, analyzing a contemporary collective fantasy in the West, that the so-called progress of secularism is the idea that the progress of secularism is internally and inevitably linked to women's equality and emancipation. The book is, as she puts it, a history of the present, and it sets out to show how this fantasy is, as she puts it, simply not true. Quote, with devastating acuteness, Scott shows not only how in earlier historical contexts the development of secularism was tied to fantasies of gender hierarchy, for example, one in which women's place was in the home, the private sphere, but she also shows how in the present the tying together of secularism and women's emancipation is itself linked to a racist attack on Islam in a collective fantasy that goes under the name Clash of Civilizations. The book seems to me a stunning fulfillment of the ambitions Professor Scott has declared for decades to write political feminist history. The book is, I think, political in Professor Scott's sense. It has the power to affect change through understanding. So having said all that, let me add that Professor Joan Scott needs no introduction. <laughs> we are here today because she has influenced us all. So please join me in welcoming Joan Scott back to the University of Chicago, where she will speak to us on the topic of gender politics and psychoanalysis. Thank you very much. That was, um, I kept thinking as you were talking, Jonathan, that maybe you should were giving my talk. <laughs> I was wondering what was left to, 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 to say. I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm very grateful to the New York of 
colloquium for this invitation. It's been a chance not only to revisit a place that I first came to about 50 years ago um, as, as the spouse of a professor, in the, of an assistant professor in the history department, but also to see any number of friends I've made over the years who are, for one reason or another, here. <laughs> and, and it's really terrific to, uh, to be here uh, again, even though the Hyde Park I remember has been prettied up and gentrified in ways that are, that are sort of astonishing to think about. So the, the talk today is um, a kind of distillation of some of the things that uh, Jonathan was referring to. It was, it's an attempt to sort of think through um, these issues of gender politics and, and psychoanalysis. So I'll start. And I'm, I'm reading, there's no PowerPoint, there's no um, quotes for you to read, there's nothing to distract your attention, just listen. The discipline of history was consolidated at the end of the 19th century when many of its most important philosophers conceived it in relationship to political power. For Hegel, the movement of history was towards freedom in the modern nation state. Herbert Baxter Adams, one of the founding fathers of the American Historical Association, took as the motto of his craft the formulation of the British historian E.A. Freeman, history is past politics and politics present history. <clears throat> For a very long time, it was the doings of the powerful, particularly the leaders of nations, that consumed the attention of historians. Indeed, the emergence and activity of the sovereign nation state and its agents stood at the very center of historical preoccupation. History was written from the top down, emphasizing the critical role of rulers, politicians, jurists, soldiers, or diplomats, and the catalyzing events of revolution, war, conquest, imperial expansion, treaties, laws, constitutions, and the like. Although some historians had long paid attention to ordinary folk, <clears throat> to experiences of class, economic development, and social movements, an important shift took place in the 1960s and 70s with the arrival and subsequent hegemony of social history, what some of us at the time referred to as history from below. This was an attempt to turn attention not only to movements of resistance to capitalism, but also to rethink concepts such as modernization, domination, community, and agency. Michel Foucault's insistence on the dispersion of power in modernity, its presence in ordinary relations which had never been thought of as exemplifying power, had an influential impact on social history and later cultural history. Foucault refused the definition of power as an object, that is, as a transferable property associated only with rule, law, wealth, and monopolies of violence, Instead, he took power to be relational, generative, understood in terms of its effects. It was productive, not repressive, constituting subjects, flowing along discourses, coursing through populations. The question was not who held power, but what forms it took and what operations it performed. With Foucault, the study of power was no longer limited to the institutions and agents of the state, but expanded to a broad range of human activities including those that were conventionally thought to lie outside the realm of the political, science, art, literature, even sex and sexual desire. These were not separate spheres of activity and power, but mutually constitutive realms. For example, scientific studies legitimated economic policy, art and literature helped make normative ideals into common sense perceptions, and sometimes also challenged them. Disciplinary associations established hierarchies of mastery and standards for the production of knowledge. The production of knowledge was at once riven with internal politics of its own and could also no longer be thought apart from more conventional notions of the dynamics of power. For those of us working on the history of women and sexuality, Foucault's formulations stretch the boundaries of our inquiries beyond the thematic, opening the way for thinking about gender <coughs> as a set of questions not only about unequal relations between women and men and about transgressive sexualities, but also about the ways in which differences of sex mattered, not literally and metaphorically, but constitutively, for the constructions of institutions that on the face of it had nothing to do with sex. In my 1986 article, Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis, I wrote, and here I have to apologize for quoting myself, but there's a reason, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to do it, but there's a reason to do it. I wrote that, quote, gender provides a way to decode meaning and to understand the complex connections among various forms of human interaction. 
when historians look for the ways in which the concept of gender legitimizes and constructs social relationships, they develop insight into the reciprocal nature of gender and society, and into the particular and <laughs> Great. All right, to finish my quote. <laughs> When historians look for the ways in which the concept of gender legitimizes and constructs social relationships, they develop insight into the reciprocal nature of gender and society, and into the particular and contextually specific ways, and here's the important part, in which politics constructs gender and gender constructs politics. For me, and that's the end of the quote, for me this represented a way to get beyond the compartmentalization of women and gender studies as a separate subfield of history, a way to insist that attention to gender could bring new insight into old questions of difference, power, and politics. Gender, from this perspective, was not a matter of the simple presence or absence of women, but of the ways in which differences of sex were used to signify all manner of other differences, racial, religious, imperial, civilizational, and to establish hierarchies within and among them. My 1986 article did not fully theorize the mutual constitution of gender and politics. I knew it could be done, but not how. This is the endlessly dissatisfied John Scott that Jonathan Weir was describing. Now, some 30 years later, I think I'm ready to attempt that theorization. Interestingly, I do this with the help of psychoanalysis, which I initially rejected because it seemed incommensurable with the project of history. The psychoanalysis I look to is not the ego psychology of the American psychohistory of the 1970s, neither, it is the, neither is it the psychoanalysis of diagnostic categories, developmental stages, and normative regulation, nor is it the psychoanalysis mobilized in France against gay marriage and adoption. It's rather what Adam Phillips has called the post-Freudian Freud, the Freud read through the lenses of post-structuralism, Jacques Lacan, Jean Laplanche, Michel Foucault, certain feminists, Naomi Shore, Joan Kopchak, Renata Salesel, through post the lenses of post-colonialism, Fanon, and theories of race and racism. It insists on the importance of language as a clue to the psychic life of subjects and to the indeterminacy of their constitution. And for my purposes, it conceives of sexual difference as a permanent enigma whose meaning is neither apparent nor immutable. It was in the theorizing of sexual difference that I found the perspective I was seeking. In that theorizing, Freud's and the Lacanian reading of Freud, the difference of sex is, is ultimately inexplicable. It's the riddle that defies fixed meaning, the understanding that always seems to escape control, the dilemma that gives rise to myth and fantasy. It's the place where questions about the relationship of mind and body are confounded. This psychoanalytic theory refuses a separation between the biological and the social or cultural, attending instead to what Z Alenka Zupanich describes as, quote, the zone where the two realms overlap, i.e., where the biological or somatic is already mental or cultural, and where at the same time, culture springs from the very impasses of the somatic functions which it tries to resolve, yet in doing so creates new ones. In other words, and this is still the quote, the overlapping in question is not simply an overlapping of two well-established entities, body and mind, but an intersection which is generative of both sides that overlap it." End of quote. Sex and sexual difference are produced at this intersection. The oppositions mind, body, culture, nature don't work here. Anatomy is not a pre-existing fact, but rather a fantasy about the body's meaning that follows from gender assignment naming the designation of, as male or female of a child at birth, and from a child's effort to account for what he or she sees or does not see imagined as castration. Laplanche, invoking history to think psychoanalysis, refers to, quote, the contingent, perceptual, and illusory character of anatomical sexual difference, which cannot ground the gender assignment that precedes it. Zupancha points out that the central point of Freud's discovery was precisely that there is no natural or pre-established place of human sexuality. The sexual, she writes, is not a substance to be properly described and circumscribed. It is the very impossibility of its own circumscription or delimitation. The sexual is not a separate domain of human activity or life, and this is why it can inhabit 
all the domains of human life. The point here is that sex and sexual difference are not simply metaphors for other areas of human activity, they are always already implicated in those other domains. Precisely because sexual difference is so central to the representation of social relationships, and because it cannot be circumscribed, great effort has been expended to fix its meaning. The body becomes the indisputable determination of gender, and then entire social and cultural edifices are built on the shaky foundations of so-called immutable gender difference. Whether taken as God's word or nature's dictate, gender, the historically and culturally variable attempt to insist on the duality of sex difference, becomes the basis for imagining social, political, and economic order, and thus for the regulation and punishment of sexual behaviors that transgress heterosexual dualities. But it's not just a matter of policing sex. The aim is to secure stability for a matrix upon which visions of social, economic, and political order rest, and in terms of which they're also contested. What makes all of this interesting for historians, of course, is that stability cannot be secured. The illusory nature of anatomical sex difference, its ultimate indefinability, introduces ambivalence, anxiety, indeterminacy, and instability into these organizing conceptual systems. The social rules that announce and enforce the meanings of the difference between women and men insist that they refer to the timeless truth of anatomical genital difference. But the only truth there is about these differences is that their meanings are ultimately impossible to secure. Anthropologists and historians have shown that the traits and roles attributed to men and women have varied across cultures and time. Philosophers have grappled with the ways in which perception informs the lived experience of a material body. Psychoanalysts have taught us to be skeptical of the power of normative regulation to contain the unruly operations of the unconscious. Gender, they argue, does not reflect the dictates of bodies. Rather, it attributes to them meanings that are inevitably contested by psychic processes, drives, fantasy, unconscious identification. These result in sexualities that do not conform to normative regulations. Gender, from this perspective, does not base its social roles on the imperatives of physical bodies. Rather, it's a historically and culturally variable attempt to provide a grid of intel intelligibility for sex, and beyond sex, for the intelligibility of systems of political rule. Those who fashion myths and offer religious or scientific explanations for differences of sex do so in the language of social organization. It's not only about men and women, but about hierarchy, lineage, property, community, and that other natural category, race. Foucault de deemed sexuality a dense transfer point for relations of power. Transfer point is the key term here, for it can suggest the mutually constitutive nature of gender and politics I want to evoke. At the same time, it suggests a certain separation that is not exactly the case. It's not that gender and politics as established entities come into contact and so influence one another. Rather, it's that the instability of each looks to the other for certainty. Political systems invoked, invoke what is deemed the immutability of gender to legitimize asymmetries of power. Those political invocations then fix differences of sex in that way denying the indeterminacy that always troubles both sex and politics. An example of the mutual constitution of sex and politics comes from Ancien Régime France in the work of Eliane Viennot, who has written three magnificent volumes on women and political power from the Renaissance to the aftermath of the French Revolution. Viennot documents the formidable political role of queens, regents, mothers, and mistresses during the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. The Valois kings, she shows, deliberately relied on noble women who moved freely in court circles and had a recognized public place. Their participation was not universally accepted, as demonstrated by the famous Querelle des Femmes and several generations of misogynist writing by disaffected bourgeois provincial spokesmen and foreigners. But the criticism was not what we might call pure misogyny. Rather, it was a form of social protest, she argues, whose motives went far beyond the activities of the women it denounced. Still, it wasn't until the Bourbon monarchs that noble women were definitively barred from politics. In an effort to consolidate monarch monarchical power, 
agents of the crown depicted noble women as capricious, harebrained, driven only by a desire for luxury and pleasure. For that reason, it was argued, they had no place in serious political deliberations. Interestingly, the characterization extended to noble men who were reduced by the architect of absolutism to frivolous appendages to court life, their influence achieved through liaison dangereuse, sexual intrigue <coughs> as a sign not of their political power, but of their political impotence. Having lost the prerogatives that once defined their very being, the court nobility were feminized, in effect, castrated. The characterization of the aristocracy as feminized was, not, was thus not invented by the 18th century revolutionaries, which I always thought was the case, and it has lasted well into future centuries. In the regime of absolutist authority, in the regime of absolutism, excuse me, authority was to be the king's alone. Everyone else served to confirm his sovereignty. There was no confusion about who was in charge, who had the phallus, the signifier of power. For many years, the treatment of women was either ignored or minimized by political historians. When historians of women focused on it, it was often as a way of documenting the operations of patriarchy. And patriarchy is indeed at issue in Viennot's analysis, but her work shows in detail its variable and changing operations as a system of power. The consolidation of royal absolutism and the disempowerment of the nobility were achieved through the downgrading of the status of women, gender and politics inseparably entwined. The historical insight to offer about the attack on noble women in the 16th century then is not about the eternal rule of misogyny, it's rather that gender serves to signify, indeed to accomplish, political changes that on the face of it have little or nothing to do with sex. If anything, the emergence of modern democratic nation states demonstrates even more starkly the imbrication of gender and politics. The end of absolutism, and with it the loss of its legitimating religious authority, introduced a new uncertainty into political representation. Possession of the phallus, the symbol of the ruler's power was no longer the prerogative of God's representative on earth. And as the reign of kings and the occasional queen gave way to representative systems of government, parliaments, constitutional monarchies, republics, democracies, the physical body of the ruler as the incarnation of sovereignty was replaced by a set of disembodied abstractions, the state, the nation, the citizen, the representative, the individual. Claude Lefort puts it this way, Quote, the locus of power becomes an empty place. It is such that no individual and no group can be consubstantial with it, and it cannot be represented. The impossibility of representation, he continues, leads to a permanent state of uncertainty. Quote, the important point is that democracy is instituted and sustained by the dissolution of the markers of certainty. It inaugurates a history in which people experience a fundamental indeterminacy as to the basis of power, as to the basis of power, law, and knowledge, and as to the relations between self and other at every level of social life. The exercise of power, shorn of its external authorization, became self-legitimating. In Weber's terms, quote, bureaucratic rule was not and is not the only variety of legal authority, but it is the purest. The jurisdictional competency is fixed by rationally established norms by enactments and decrees and regulations in such a manner that the legitimacy of the authority becomes the legality of the general rule, which is purposely thought out, enacted, and announced with formal correctness." End of quote. This abstract calculating force is what I take Foucault to mean by power, but that's another story. There is then no outside affirmation of the laws men create. The circularity of the system is apparent. According to Kochek, modern power is imminent in the very relations that structure the social order. Or, as Lefort put it, only the mechanisms of the exercise of power are visible, or only the men, the mere mortals, who hold political authority. In the abstract, the impossibility of power's representation is clear. But for those who implemented the system, the question of who was charged with articulating and enforcing the decrees remained. It's here that Freud's theorizing, in Totem and Taboo especially, helps shed some light on the reasons that men become the embodiments of political authority in democratic polities. In his interpretation, there was a primal father, a king, whose power lay in his monopoly of all pleasure. Lesser men eventually kill and in Freud's version, eat him 
in order to gain the access they had been consistently denied. By devouring the father figure, the men retrospectively become brothers. Freud says that in this way they, quote, accomplish their identification with him, and each of them acquired a portion of his strength. Coming into their own as adults required the sexual initiation that the father had forbidden them, an appropriate woman of their own. The brothers institute a prohibition of incest to ensure that this woman will not be a mother or sister, all of whom had been gained for the primal father's seductions. The rule of the sons then replaces the absolutism of the father. Some form of fraternity overrules, overthrows the reign of the king. In Freud's terms, an ideal father replaces the primal father. It is he or they, the sons acting collectively to achieve this ideal, whose actions must protect society from a return of excess. Quote, and thus guaranteeing one another's lives, the brothers were declaring that no one of them must be treated by another as their father was treated by them all. They were precluding the possibility of a repetition of their father's fate, end of quote. There were nonetheless continuing, continuing rivalries among the brothers, and these were managed by assigning to each a smaller, tamer version of what they rebelled against. Quote, again Freud, the family was a restoration of the former primal horde, and it gave back to fathers a large portion of their former rights. There were, there were once more fathers, but the social achievements of the fraternal clan had not been abandoned. End of quote. The new regime stands for, in Joe Kochet's words, the evacuation or drying up of excess enjoyment, and thus for the possibility of pleasures even apportionment. The laws of marriage in this vision guarantee pleasures even apportionment, ensuring that each brother has his own woman and that no brother has more than one. In the realm of the psyche, shared political power depends on the disciplining of sexuality by marriage, the containment of desire within a socially beneficial family unit. In the political realm, the idea of abstract individualism rests on a presumed sameness. Whatever the social differences among men, and, and not all men, only those usually white, whose higher rationality define them as autonomous individuals. We might characterize the system with the formulation one man, one woman, one man, one vote. <laughs> Whose sexuality is at issue in the wake of the parasite? There are two possibilities and they're related. The first, suggested by the work of Lacan, <clears throat> is that the danger of excess lies with the brothers who compete among themselves in order that one of them will be able to exercise the slain father's power. Freud noted that the rivalry among the brothers continued even after their father's death. Quote, each of them would have wished, like his father, to have all of the women to himself. <clears throat> this fantasy, the notion that his likeness to the father exempts one of the brothers from castration, and so gives him access to all the women, Lacan calls it the phallic exception, is ever present, expressed not only in adulterous liaisons, but in all manner of political contests in which candidates seek to display the signs of their exceptionalism and so to demonstrate their unique possession of the phallus, now equated literally and mistakenly with the penis. Here we might think of Silvio Berlusconi and Donald Trump, surrounded by all those glittering women, as striving to reincarnate the deposed father's monopoly of power. The apparent claim to an individual man's uniqueness is actually a collective male fantasy, and therein, of course, lies the trouble. Since there's no single body that can act as the concrete referent for power, as the kings did when he was considered the divinely ordained occupant of the throne, the question of how to discern possession is an open and anxious one. The emphasis on reason and some men's brains as the sign of this power I suggest, is a displacement of that anxious question from the pulsating general region, genital regions to the lofty heights of abstraction, a recognition that the penis is a poor substitute, though it remains the distinguishing feature of masculinity. Indeed, masculinity, referring concretely to the sex of the primal father and symbolically to the phallus he wielded, remained the criterion that the band of brothers insisted upon. The French socialist feminist Jean de Rouen who was prevented on the grounds of her sex from running for office during the Revolution of 1848, pointed to the, to the dilemma that men faced as they at once avowed and denied their bodies as justification for their exclusive power. Responding to Pierre-Joseph Proudhon's comment that women legislators made as much sense as male wet nurses, she asked, and what organs, what organs are necessary for becoming a legislator? <laughs> Proudhon, faced with a challenge to the idea that the penis and phallus were one, did not reply. 
The other possibility, <clears throat> the one seized on by early political theorists, is that women represent the danger of excess that the brothers now have to guard against. In this scenario, the appetites of the primal father are in effect attributed to women's provocation. And she is Eve, the seductress, the initiator of the fall. It's women who threaten to subvert men's rationality to lure them off course. Rousseau warned, warned in Emile that unlike men, women could not control their unlimited desires. It was the only imposition of modesty that prevented the ruin of both sexes. Otherwise, women's lust would lead mankind to perish by the means establishing, established for preserving it. Hegel thought that women were driven by intrigue and particular interests unfit for the universal mission of government. He warned that, quote, if women hold the helm of government, the state is at once in jeopardy. Marriage for these authors is not only the channeling by modesty of women's sexuality into restrained displays of affection, but the institutionalization of the separation of spheres, the literal containment of women's unruly desire within the walls of the home is critical to the proper functioning of the state. The two possibilities are, of course, linked. Lacan points out that in the realm of the unconscious, women's desire serves to confirm men's possession of the phallus, both personally and politically. Without her, there's no proof of his potency. But the proof must remain indirect, at least at the level of public representation, where men's claim to equality rests on abstraction, on the presumed sameness of the brothers, and all sexuality is located concretely in women's bodies. Women's desire confirms men's possession of the phallus, that so-called private relation of family, a familial sexual intimacy in turn, establishes men's potency, and so their right to political power. And this follows all manner of legislation regulating sex, sexuality, marriage, and the like. It's not only social hygiene that is, is, that is an issue, but a form of what Foucault called biopolitics that constitutes the very ground on which political power operates. The emergence of modern nations brought with it a new insistence on the immutability of gender roles and the policing of sexual activity to keep them in place. Historians working on Germany, France, England, and the United States have observed over and over again what they call the hardening of the lines of gender differentiation as an aspect of an overall emphasis on divisions of labor from the 18th century on. On the one hand, <clears throat> the natural difference of sex was the referent that provided legitimation for men's political authority. The quote, is it to men that nature confided domestic cares? Asked the French Revolutionary in 1793 when outlawing women's political clubs. Has she given us breasts to feed our children? On the other hand, men's political authority was evidence for nature's mandate. Those who opposed granting suffrage to women saw it as a denial, suffrage, as a denial of the very masculinity that citizenship conferred. So it was that an irate journalist demanded of the French suffragist Hubertine Auclair in 1877, is it our resignation as men that Dame Hubertine asks of us? If so, let her say it frankly. The difference of sex, in other words, was the key to the seeming resolution of the impossibility of the representation of political power that Lefort theorizes. Without it, the illusion of certainty cannot be sustained. But it's not a definitive resolution, since there's no stable meaning either for the difference of sex, hence the repeated expressions of anxiety about whether the extension to women of education and various civil rights, divorce, inheritance of property, guardianship of children, would obliterate the lines of sexual difference and make women and men the same. This confusion of the sexes, according to one medical commentator, posed to the nation the terrifying danger of moral anarchy. In the wake of World War I, historian Mary Louise Roberts writes, the blurring of the boundary between male and female, a civilization without sexes, served as a primary referent for the ruin of civilization itself. We can hear that anguished prophecy of end times echoing to our own day from opponents of feminist and queer theories who argue that historicizing established norms about women and men is an assault against the very foundations of civilized life. To take only two examples, during the debates that led to the creation of the International Criminal Court in 1999, one commentator noted that, the, that if the word gender were allowed to refer to anything beyond biologically defined male and female, the court would be in the position of, quote, drastically restructuring societies throughout the world. 
This same concern about the radical potential of gender to challenge the established meanings of sex difference was expressed by the opponents of, uh, of a French curriculum that aimed at gender equity in 2011 and of France's law on gay marriage in 2013. The theory of gender, they argued, and this is again a quote, by denying sexual difference will overturn the organization of our society and call into question its very foundations. The theory of gender, if indeed a theory it is, does not deny sexual difference, but it does historicize it, maintaining that gender consists of historically specific articulations defining the male and female that aim to settle the indeterminacy associated with sexual difference by directing fantasy to some political or social end. Challenges to these articulations elicit not only adamant insistence about their immutability, but an intensification of the policing of regulatory norms. For historians, debates about sexual difference should not be read then simply as asides in the great narrative of state formation. Instead, they offer clues to instabilities and indeterminacies in the political system itself. There are many examples to offer. I've already referred to the ways in which Berlusconi and Trump present themselves as primal fathers, offering to fix everything that's wrong in their nations simply by the exercise of their inordinate powers. If we, def if we defer to them as wives to husbands, children to fathers, they will provide all the security we need in return. It's not the analogy to asymmetrical family relations that demonstrates my point in these cases. It's the bold assertion of exceptional masculinity as the cure for economic distress, social division, and the threat of terrorism that illustrates the mutually constitutive relationship of gender and politics. It's precisely at moments of great political instability that invocations of gender, not always the same ones, not always in the same way, seek to stabilize the political system. In France these days, as elsewhere in Europe, the question of how to deal with immigrant populations from former colonies, and now millions of refugees from war-torn regions of the Middle East, has all called into question such fundamental issues as democratic practices and national sovereignty. The status of Muslim women is at the heart of many of the discussions about the challenge to national identity that these immigrants and refugees present. They are said to be oppressed, while we enjoy gender equality. The measure of equality is sexual emancipation, overshadowing the very real inequalities in our countries, inequalities of wages, access to jobs, political office, economic security, and the widespread experience of domestic violence and sexual harassment. I don't know how many of you noticed in yesterday's paper that uh, the French legislators are now talking about passing laws about sexual harassment in the streets in the wake of um, the uh, Harvey Weinstein scandals in the United States, that they had their own Dominique Strauss-Kahn scandal four or five years ago. Had, there was an outburst of, of horror, certainly no laws passed, and then it went away. It seems that people seem to have forgotten in the, in the attention to it now. Equality among Muslims is offered as a reason that they can never become fully French, that is fully assimilated into the secular culture said to define the identity of members of the French nation. There are, of course, divisions within French public opinion about the assimilability of Muslims, but as the debate rages, it is clear that the status of women is not all that is at stake. Rather, it's the very place of difference in the image of the nation that is being called into question, and not for the first time. Long touted as a nation one and individual, official policy in France has refused to recognize social, racial, religious, and ethnic differences in the collection of demographic data, as if to recognize those differences would introduce irreparable fissures into the very being of the nation. Sexual difference is the only difference acknowledged, and it's said to be a difference unlike any other because it is natural, that is immutable and enduring. And yet in some political discourses, the asymmetry of the heterosexual couple provides a model for the representation of other differences. This is the case for a group I've called aristocratic Republicans, prominent intellectuals who have suggested that seduction is a trait of French national character. The open play, this is really serious. <laughs> the open play of erotic heterosexual encounter dates, they have argued, back to the time of absolutism. Happily, traces of it remain in French DNA, despite the arrival of republicanism with its dangerous, leveling democratic tendencies. Seduction involves the, quote, loving submission of women to men, 
Women's power resides in their ability to satisfy and control men's otherwise uncontained desire. The couple represents the subordination of difference to <coughs> universality, of women to men, but also of racial and ethnic and other differences to the nation. At a time when the question of how and whether to represent the differences present in French society, questions raised by a host of social movements from the feminist call for parité in politics to gay activists' demands for the right to marry and adopt children, to calls for recognition by les indigènes de la République and others, when these groups open the door to new concepts of representation, the aristocratic Republicans' refusal was articulated in terms of seduction. The theory of seduction, and that's what they called it, these people offered was not just a rejection of feminism, it was explicitly that, but it was also a way of protecting their vision of French national identity from the actual and many challenges it was facing. The attack on Muslim women and their veils is another manifestation of the ways in which recourse to gender seeks to stabilize a Republican politics that is fraught with contradiction. Here I want to invoke something I've called the French political unconscious. This refers to an unacknowledged but persistent contradiction within French republicanism between political equality and sexual difference. The contradiction has been evident since 1789 and did not disappear when women won the vote in 1944. Citizenship in France is based on abstract individualism. The individual is the essential unit, regardless of religion, ethnicity, social position, or occupation. When they are abstracted from these tra traits, individuals are considered to be the same, that is, equal. In the long history of French politics, one obstacle to sameness has been sexual difference, taken to be a natural distinction and therefore not susceptible to abstraction. Nature has decreed a lack of sameness and inequality that society cannot correct. In this view, men can escape their sex, but women cannot. There is then a deep incompatibility between the universal promise of equality in Republican political theory and the inequality decreed by nature. Sexual difference does not seem susceptible to Republican logic. When women won the vote, it was as a particular group, not as individuals. In the debates about parité, the position that finally won passage of the law, a law which requires equal numbers of men and women on the ballots in some elections, the, the position that one passage of that law offered the heterosexual couple as the substitute for the singular individual. Sylvian Agostinsky argued for parité and against the PACS, the domestic partnership um, law in 1999, that there could be neither same-sex parliaments nor same-sex families. The complementarity of difference substituted for the equality of all individuals. As I've mentioned in the Eloge to Seduction as a trait of French national character, Complementarity is asymmetrical. Women lovingly consent to their subordination to men. The emphasis on the openness of seductive play between women and men, and especially the public display of women's bodies, serves to demonstrate the difference of women and the need for a different treatment of them. As such, it denies the problem that sex poses for Republican political theory. Paradoxically, the objectification of women's sexuality serves to veil a constitutive contradiction of French republicanism, its inability to reconcile natural sexual difference with the promise of equality for all. Muslim women's dress seems to present a challenge to this view of things, threatening to expose the denied or repressed contradiction of republican theory. Modest dress directly addresses the problems that sex and sexuality pose for social relations and for politics. It declares that sexual relations are off limits in public places. Some Muslim feminists say this actually liberates them, but whether that's the case or not, or whether indeed every woman who dons a veil understands its symbolism in this way, the veil sign signals the acceptance of sexuality and even its celebration, but only under proper circumstances, that is in private within the family. The paradox here is that the veil makes explicit, available for all to see, the rules of public gendered interaction, which declare sexual exchanges out of bounds in public space. It's this explicit acknowledgement of a problem that French political theory wants to deny that makes the veil conspicuous in the terms of the law that outlawed it in the sexual sense of that word. Muslim women's dress is a statement about the difficulties that sex presents for public interactions, difficulties Republicans want to deny. Their pious pronouncement about equality are at odds with their deep uneasiness about sharing power with the opposite sex. Seduction for them is a preferable alternative. Just as the aristocratic Republicans, and I'm coming to the end now, 
insistence on seduction spoke to the issue of differences in French society, the need to subordinate them lovingly to a unified nation. So the controversies about veiled Muslim women speak to these same questions about the place of social differences in the representation of the nation. Of the, nation. the intolerable gender inequality ascribed to Muslims is a way of putting the blame on them for the political, social, and economic inequalities they experience as a discriminated against minority. France is not denying Muslims their rights in this view of it. Rather, the Muslims, in their management of sexual difference, and by extension of all human relationships, are disqualifying themselves as French. In this way, existing and persisting inequalities within French society, equalities, inequalities that include religion, race, and ethnicity, go unremarked. These inequalities are not an aberration. They are integral to a political system that makes an abstract sameness the ground for equality and the concrete difference of sex the model for unequal treatment of those who for natural or social reasons do not measure up. My examples of the interconnections of gender and politics have been drawn from France because that's the field in which I do most of my work. The lesson I would take from these examples, however, is broader. It's at once theoretical and methodological. These are the questions I think historians should be asking about the relationship between gender and politics through the lenses of psychoanalysis. If there is a great consternation about gender, look for the politics that has sought legitimation in the supposed enduring truths of sexual difference. How do challenges to gender norms threaten established political systems? Which systems and in what ways? Second, if political systems are in crisis, Look for the ways gender is invoked to promote or resolve them. What do appeals to the immutability of sexual difference tell us about how war is justified or about the motives and ambitions of political leaders? What are the implicit erotic messages of electoral campaigns? There are many more questions to be posed, but one thing is sure. The study of power by historians is enriched immeasurably when gender and politics are understood to be mutually constitutive. You may have to probe deeply and read with attention to expression and ideas you haven't considered before, but the connections will be there. And if you find the connections, you'll see that they inevitably lead you to unresolvable contradictions and ambiguities. The instabilities in the categories of both politics and the differences of sex. Instabilities that not only demand resolution, but because resolution is ultimately impossible, also identify the possibilities and the openings for change. Uh, Professor Scott is said she's happy to entertain questions, and we have uh, two people with microphones. Uh, so please raise your hands if you'd like to. Um, hearing you talk about the immutability of sexual difference. And I'm thinking about a world in which people are transitioning this way, that way. Some people are saying they're both. Some people are saying they're neither. We're having an issue with pronouns and bathrooms. Uh, we also seem to be in a mood on Earth in which politics is going in, in a very sort of crude and unsubtle direction. Uh, what do you make of, do you think this is significant? I mean, how does this relate to the immutability of difference, to the stability, the search for stability in relation to gender? If it seems like in a moment of conservative politics, gender is flying all over the place. I, I, did, I absolutely agree with you, gender is flying, but that's not the, sexual, the psychoanalytic notion of sexual difference that I'm talking about. The, the psychoanalytic notion of sexual difference says not that sexual difference is immutable, but that the problem of what the difference of sex means is unresolvable. It's, a, it's an enigma that cannot be resolved. So you attribute gender at birth to a boy and a girl, um, and the kid spends um, his life or her life trying to figure out what that means, um, fantasizing about all kinds of things. There are rules about what you can and can't do. People now are violating those rules like crazy, and that's fine, but that doesn't change 
the argument I'm making is that we can understand what's going on now, not as a rejection of um, the impossibility of sexual difference, but the, a, a symptom of the fact that there are attempts to always resolve it. There's been an opening now in society which permits questioning the norms that much more uh, carefully and rigidly define what a man and woman is. So in some ways what you're seeing is the explosion of what Freud writes about as being sort of, of under wraps uh, in, in other periods of time. And it's the uncertainty about what the differences of sex ultimately mean, and there the impossibility of resolving that problem, that for me opens the possibility of historicizing the notion of gender. Not simply saying that we thought about what men and women were differently in, in different times, but linking it particularly to the political side, the Lefort's definition of the uncertainty that democracy produces in terms of who embodies power and where it lies. So you have two uncertainties. The, the, the uncertainty about what sexual difference ultimately means, the uncertainty about what, um, who embodies, who legitimately embodies power. And each of them is used to justify the other in different ways and at different times. But the, the um, insistent masculinity of the French revolutionaries um, is some, it tells, telling you something about their claim to um, embody the power that the king, the, the, the displaced and beheaded king, has, has uh, given up or has been taken away from the displaced. So it's, it's, it's not, I, I wasn't saying that, that the arguments are that these are immutable that gender is immutable, that you know, what we know about democratic uh, representation is immutable. But the, the facts are that you have these two um, areas of uncertainty that work to create one and the other. Politics looks to gender um, to, to uh, legitimize its argument about who has the right to power. Gender, looks, gender gets sort of fixed, I, I think I should say that at one point, by the political invocation of the immutable natural differences or God-given differences between the sexes. So it's, it's that notion of sexual difference. And I think that that notion of sexual difference explains the ability of the variety now of gender possibilities that are being presented and the, the ability for them to get some kind of traction uh, because <laughs> there's no fixed meaning that can ever be established. And, and the attempt to shut all of that down is about not only um, regulating gender norms, but about the nature of political power. I mean, Trump seems to be, to be the embodiment of that in some ways. He is the primal father. The, the fact that he can break all the laws that he wants to make, the fact that he has you know, women, including his daughter, whom he refers to in, in sexualized and, and um, erotic ways, uh, the, the sort of, um, libidinal charge of his, of his power depends on shutting down challenges to, uh, on, on gay rights, on transgender, on all of that. I mean, the, 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 the fixing of his masculinity is not just about his masculinity. It's about preserving a, a, a way of understanding power in politics that depends on gender norms that are, are being called into question by all manner of of, of um, deviations that, that, that you're pointing to. So, so the, the political crisis and the, it looks to gender to stabilize itself in ways that um, probably are impossible to do at this point. But that's how I was thinking that the, the intersections of, of sexual, the, the impossibility of defining sexual difference and the uncertainties of de democratic political power. Tom, you're here. Uh, thank you, Joan, for a marvelous talk. Uh, I wonder, you mentioned earlier that um, the question of race also uh, has to be uh, stirred into this uh, strange brew that makes us the crazy people we are. Uh, and I, I wonder, in line with your answer to the last question, whether you could reflect on the intersection of 
of race and gender in the last election and the way that, uh, I mean, this is the first American presidential election that pitched uh, a man against a woman. Yeah. Um, and at the same time involved that woman, a white woman, uh, staging herself as the continuity and successor to a black man who had been, and of course, as we know, Trump's first gesture was not to attack um, uh, women uh, or to, uh, right, to feminize the opponent, Obama. but to declare Obama, uh, you know, to, to be a black man already, to, to make him guilty. Uh, could you reflect on this for us? <laughs> well, you've done it so well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the um, did you see it coming? <laughs> <laughs> and why didn't you tell us? <laughs> why didn't you tell? Because historians never predict anything. Right. The job of historians is to tell you what happened, not to tell you what will happen. Um, I guess, I guess the, the, the way I, I think of this, maybe not specifically talking about, I mean, I think the Trump, the, my, my best reading of Trump actually was, have you read the Tanisha Coates thing? In, uh, essay in the Atlantic called Our First White President. I mean, I think his discussion of his Jeremiah about, um, because I think that's what it is. Uh, it's been criticized as not giving enough uh, political analysis, not telling us what to do. But I think it's a Jeremiah, and, it, and it's an insistence that race is fundamental to thinking um, America and American politics. Um, I, I guess, in some ways, what you could think of is the ways in which, and, and what I'm thinking of in answer is, takes it away a little bit. But um, in, in Anne McClintock's book, Imperial Leather, remember that, 1995, I think is when it, when it comes out. Um, and I thought it was, it was I, I just reread it for some other reason. And this is a professor of English, not of history, who is, is writing a history about British imperialism in which she uses the notion of fetishism as, as a way both of arguing with feminists about the binary nature of sexual difference and gender, but also she reads race, class, and sexuality as mutually constitutive. You can't sort of separate them. And she has one line in, in, in or one place in which she says um, that, that these, these things are not separate. They're not intersectional units that come into connection one with the other, but that they are mutually constitutive, as I said, they come in, into relation, and this is a quote from the, each other, if in contradictory and conflictual ways. So one example she gives, colonized people are figured as sexual deviants, while European gender deviants are figured as racial deviants. And there's some way in which the racialization of, of Clinton and the, it's not really a feminization, but it is in some ways a feminization of Obama, are working in some way together. That, that connecting her to him and, and depicting her as, as a kind of unacceptable female figure, she's, she's masculinized in, in some way, but also tarring her, literally tarring her with the brush of her association with, with Obama. There, there's something going on there, and I think we need to sort of think it more um, contextually. We need to sort of read some of those horrible things he says and speeches and stuff. But I think there's a kind of racializing of sex and sexualizing of race that's going on there, in which the two things are not separate, but, but working to unconsciously evoke the, the racist reaction toward, to her and the sexist or misogynist relation, reaction to him. I mean, there's something that's being manipulated there that is eliciting, at least among his followers, those complicated responses of the unacceptability of either of those of, of those people, or those embodiments of, of politics. It's about the embodiment of politics, which can be either neither sexualized nor racialized, something like that, I think. Thank you, Joan. Um, I have three questions, I'm gonna fold them into two. Uh, so you're getting a deal. Um, so the first question's very quick. It has to do with, I mean, you're explaining why it is that historians should turn to the tools of psychoanalysis. But as you know, people like Kopchak, who you cited a lot, Joan Kopchak, who you cited a lot in this talk, 
really used psychoanalysis against what she called the historicist, right? And a sort of historicist way of thinking about gender. So maybe you could just speak very quickly to that as to why you think that quarrel from that end is wrong. The other question really goes to, I'm trying to get a better hold on the analytic purchase for you of psychoanalysis. In other words, what is it that psychoanalysis is giving you in this wonderful you know, set of you know, historical mm -hmm. uh, sto stories that you told us that you couldn't have gotten from the own practice of historiography that you yourself have developed and that you've worked off of Foucault. So what I come down with is something like you turn to psychoanalysis because it really insists on the fundamental indeterminacy or contingency, if you like, of identity, specifically gender, sexual difference, and the rest. Fine, I don't have a problem with that, and I, I don't at all have a question that someone like Donald Trump, for example, you know, could be read as the primal father. Mm -hmm. But what's the really interest? I mean, one point it seems to me is that the stuff about contingency, don't you get that from a certain way of thinking about history anyway? In other words, that historical events are themselves contingent, that political actions are contingent, and the sense of necessity in history is something that really is overlaid by historians on a set of contingent events. So, I'm not entirely sure why you have to turn to psychoanalysis for that, even to talk about gender and the construction of gender over time. I just want to get more clarity about what gender is doing for you in that score. No, you mean what and, psychoanalysis is doing. Right, I'm sorry, psychoanalysis is doing for you. And finally, this part of the second question um, <laughs> is, I guess my, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to psychoanalytic readings. My concern has to do with whether the psychoanalytic framework is not essentially standing in as a kind of universal sort of framework into which we then put these historically specific or contingent events to try to get a certain kind of reading. So if you could respond to that <laughs> objection of why it is that psychoanalysis is in that sense, not just a kind of, if you like, black box, like there are certain kind of universal things like primal fathers and all that, and Trump is one of them, and you know Berlusconi was probably one too, and so on. Like, how does one avoid generating analyses <coughs> in which psychoanalysis does function as that kind of black box into which the contingencies of history, which are really the important kinds of questions like why Trump and not someone else? Can psychoanalysis actually explain that? There are a lot of primal fathers or want to be primal fathers out there. So, <laughs> well, I, th I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a huge number of questions. It's more than three. <laughs> <laughs> I was counting them. Um, I guess the, the, the sort of simplest way of, of arguing that, the, the analytic purchase I get is that gender, which is what I'm interested in, right, which is somehow my name has become synonymous with it, because it's somehow, somehow difficult, but that gender is about um, the explanation for the difference of sex. And if you need a theory to talk about sex and sexuality, it's psychoanalysis. There is no other way to think about um, the, the the, what gender is trying to do in relation to the puzzle of, of the difference of sex. So, yes, it's contingent, but the kind of contingency, or historical contingency you're talking about, there's all sorts of contingencies. My particular project is, is to understand the relationship between gender and politics, not to talk about historical contingency as an abstraction or, or writ large, and how those two operate as or in the context of um, contingent 
events, developments, and so on. It's not the only way to read history. I'm not arguing that psychoanalysis is the explanation for all of history. I'm arguing that to think the relation, to think gender beyond women's history, to think gender beyond the study of misogyny and patriarchy, to think gender as a way in which politics achieves its purchase, and I think that you can't understand the success of Trump without looking at the libidinal appeal that the primal father offers to the people he was, uh, who, who voted for him, the women and the men. I mean, I think there are economic interests, there are all sorts of other things we could talk about in, in the election of Trump, resentment about elites, da 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 da. But how did it work? It worked libidinally. And there's no other way to, to understand that working. And it's because he knows how to manipulate that particular um, charge that pulls in the, the, the response that, that it did. So I think what I'm arguing is that psychoanalysis, one, in relation to, to gender, my problematic, helps me think historically, and this gets back to the, the, the coke checking, helps me historicize in a, in a good way, in a way I don't think she, I think her notion of what historicizing is has to do with the attempt to deny that, um, that enig enigmatic thing of sexual difference, the attempt to sort of pin it down, to, uh, to say that there's a history to it, that you're da da da, and, and I think, I mean, we can turn to the experts <laughs> for help on this, but her argument about historicism has to do with the way in which attempts to um, explain the enigma of sexual difference have relied upon um, explanations external to the phenomenon and the enigma itself, to the fact that sex and sexuality um, don't, are, are not their own domain but operate everywhere, uh, but that the, the thing itself is, escapes any attempt to explain. So that, that's, that's and, and finally I think I would say that for me, psychoanalysis adds a reading practice to the kinds of reading I've learned to do of historical phenomenon. And it, may, it, it attunes me, um, and not as well as, as I think probably some people who have been doing this a lot longer, attunes me to issues, to uh, forms of speech, to um, invocations of, of particular images that I wouldn't have paid attention to before. That's, that's the way I would, I would answer that. Um, I'm trying to unpack all of this in my brain and uh, some of the conversations and questions that actually the first question, since we're in this current political situation and sitting down and sometimes talking through that macro level theory is not the most practical way to have a conversation about any current situ political situations when I'm thinking of any advice on how if that fixed meaning really isn't something we can fix, <laughs> pinpoint, how can, how can we have these kind of daily conversations about gender and politics without assuming that fixed meaning? It, and maybe my question isn't quite as articulated as I want it to be, but any advice on? Well, I mean, I think there are two separate issues. Thank you. Um, and, and you know, you know any say. number of, of political theorists will say that the relationship between theory and practice is not one-to-one. Uh, -one. So the point of trying to think theoretically is to uh, figure out what needs to be addressed, but that doesn't mean, and, and, and to sort of give you a sense, or to give one a sense of the possibilities of thinking a problem beyond the way in which it's been framed. So on the question of, of gender, and, and I remember once, a, a French guy, a, a French reporter for something was interviewing me about gender and he said, but how does your theories about gender help me decide who's going to take out the garbage tonight, my wife or me? <laughs> I can't help you with that. That's what I said to him. I said, you and your wife have to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, you need a, you need a, it's your problem. So, but, but I think what you're saying is, when you, what you have to understand is that you're in a situation 
in which certain norms prevail, and in which the invocation of those norms are going to try to regulate the behavior. So you, you have a situation um, in which uh, a boy, a little boy, this actually happened. Um, I have a grandson who for a, a couple of years wanted to only wear dresses. And the things that would happen in the street, when we were walking along the street, oh, what a beautiful girl you have here. And he would look and he'd say, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. And it was like, these people would be would back away. You know, you know? So there's two questions there. One, how you, you deal with this kid not getting hurt by the kind of, of reaction to him. And you're understanding that this is, this is a set of explorations that are going on and that he, you know. So it seems to me that understanding that gender is a set of open questions and that what one does in thinking one's attributed role is to play with it, fantasize about it, object to it, accept it, that something like that is going on and you respond to the situation with that understanding but with also a set of practical questions about, you know, do you let this kid do that? The answer, of course, was yes. His parents were, were fine about it. In fact, he had a thing, given what Laura was referring to before, the kind of openness about this stuff. We were in the playground one day, and he, he came in in a dress, and one of his friends looked at him and said, oh, that one's not very good. I wore my sister's yesterday, and that was really, really better. <laughs> so you think to yourself, there's hope, right? This is like in, the, in the playground of the, of the kids. So, but, but I, think, I think the point is that one, one's response to the question of experimental um, of, of, or attributions, the, the relationship between the attribution of the rules and the response of the individual is always open. It's not just the extreme cases. It's everybody's mm -hmm. playing around with this. What does it mean to be a woman? You know, go around this room and, and, and do a, a, a set of questions and you'll come up with very different answers. I mean, the, the, the great fights of the early second wave feminism was, you know, did we want to be equal or different? Um, did, did we want to be like French feminists and wear fancy shoes or, you know, be like American feminists and be kind of... There were all of these debates that, that were serious issues. So it seems to me that if theoretically you, you think that there is a set of open questions about which everyone has some kind of uh, question of accommodation or not, then thinking what I imagine you're raising, the issues of equality, of, of who does what, of how to do it, are better informed in your arguments than they otherwise might be. That's, that's the, the only answer I think I can give to Thank that you. kind of, of question. Thank you so much. Um, is there a microphone? Coming to you. I'm in shell shock because I recall it was my youngest daughter and your grandson who often would exchange clothes at various parties. And stuff. Well, he's your uh, grandson too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, I, I'm bringing this down to. Here uh, we go. Right? <laughs> I think we have a shrink here. <laughs> right, right. Bringing this back down to the political level, I, as you were uh, talking about uh, these issues, it, it struck me as interesting, and I would like you to elaborate on what is now happening with our, our revered leader of the Department of Education and our Attorney General, hardly a primal father figure, I think. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, they seem to be moving. Life. More like it. <laughs> but they seem to be moving in, 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 in the context of the issues related to um, uh, sexual issues on campuses uh, to move away from protections for the alleged victims towards more protections for the elected, alleged victimizers. And I wonder if you'd elaborate on how, if at all, that fits into your theories. Well, I think, I think it, it's really, it's a tricky question that you're asking me because Title IX, which is what they're talking about um, reviewing, I, I'm a member of a committee at, on the AAPP, the American Association of University Professors, that wrote a very critical report on Title IX, partly because of the 
lowered standard of proof that is required for an accusation of sexual harassment. And we argued that um, we thought it was, it was a mistake to have done that because um, in many of the cases that actually come forward, the race has become part of the issue. And, and an accusation against a black man will carry more weight and greater penalties than against a white man. Uh, this is what the, the law people at, at Harvard reported in, in their stuff. So the, the, the question of, um, and so then Betsy DeVos comes along and picks that sort of stuff up and it put us in a terrible position because it was like, no, we don't want to support what, she's, what she is arguing for. And I think there is a difference which is that what they're trying to do, and this does relate back to the, to the talk, what they're trying to do is remove the question of the inequalities of sex from consideration and talk instead about uh, drunken girls and, and misbehaving boys to turn it into a sort of issue of, well, that's what happens between men and women. Um, and, you know, so what? Or we'll police it, but we won't police it in the way that, that uh, was, was done before. So in some ways, the question of Title IX is, is a, a tricky one. And she found the way of seizing on, on an issue that the left, or the, whatever you want to call us, were worried about, that the, the, the lawyers in various universities and stuff were worried about. At the same time, and, and the, you know, the, the case of, of, what's her name, Laura Kipnis at Northwestern was an example that there were, there were then, the other, the other thing we criticized, which she doesn't, is that the enforcement of Title IX became an issue not of, of assault and attack, but of speech. So that a teacher in a gender studies class would be talking about something, and curse, maybe, that happened at um, Louisiana State, um, and say some, make some passing comment in which she used a, a bad word. And a right-wing religious student in the class reports her and claims that she has been sexually harassed by having to listen to that speech. And that then, and, and the woman is fired, the, the, who, a tenured professor of education is fired because the professor, the president of LSU argued um, she was a professor of education and for elementary school teachers to hear a curse word in a classroom, in a college classroom, was a violation of her job at, to set an example for them in the way they would teach the first graders. I mean, the stuff was, was really... So as it extended into the questions of um, classroom speech, of pedagogy, of uh, all sorts of things that had nothing to do... Well, Laura Kipnis wrote an article that students, some students objected to, and they filed a, a her sexual harassment claim against her. So the, the expansion of the notion of sexual harassment to a whole set of areas that where it didn't seem to belong was also one of our criticisms. That has not been addressed in any way at all, as you would expect, by, um, by Betsy DeVos and, and her attempt to sort of look at this. But I do think it's, it's more about sort of take, you know, what, is, what are people making such a fuss about? sexual harassment, this is what girls and boys do. And you know, that gets out of hand, it does this, it's, it's not, it, it, let's, let's normalize it rather than um, get upset about it. That's, I think that's, that's how I would answer that. We've got time for one last question. We'll have a reception afterwards, but one last question. If Karen, your hand is a little sore. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my, uh, I am a student, I'm testing my understanding what you actually said. And, and my understanding was that you want to write gender into history writing, and particularly history of politics, which I think is, is uh, very necessary, and all of that. But at the same time, you seem to almost essentialize the uh, uncertainty about sexual difference as a historical constant. And I was wondering whether there aren't times in history when other processes, economic processes, or you know, enter a coalition or have a hinge with politics that trumps 
the sexual trumps in, <laughs> in a sense of over, over uh, privileging, you know, not in the sense of suppressing, but in the sense of being for a time, at actual times of certain kinds, you know, more important, even the ways of knowledge at uh, some point in history might have um, had a primary uh, role in uh, as a driver of what's going on, or, or as a, a, a you know, catching the attention, <laughs> whatever you want to say. Now you could analyze that again with some uh, 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 psychoanalytic framework, within some psychoanalytic framework, but it would mean that the hinge between gender and, and politics would be less important during that time, or would not be at the forefront, or would not be a driver. Well, first of all, I didn't say that this was the only way to do history. Um, I think I've said that now twice. But I, I, I'm not arguing for uh, what, in fact, in the 1970s was called psychohistory, and, and which, which was it, said that everything could be explained this way. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing that it's a a way of thinking some of these relationships that is extremely extremely useful. And I don't think I don't think to say that the problem of sexual difference is unsolvable is essentializing sexual difference. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think that to, to essentializing sexual difference would would be to say that there is this thing and men are this and women are this and it's operating it's exactly what I'm working against is, is that essentializing notion. But also I think that, that um, of course there are economic and there are all sorts of other and additional and important explanations for politics and political events. I just want us to think about them psychoanalytically as well, which means because psychoanalysis, you can't do psychoanalysis without sex, that the domain, and, and because I think, I, I, didn't, I didn't read that, but there's this other wonderful quote from Joan Kocek. She says, if sex has a way of showing up everywhere, this is because it has no proper domain. Sex cannot be located either in the biological or cultural domain, nor does it have a separate domain of its own. Rather, it is manifested exclusively in parasitic negative phenomena. If this negative definition of sex sounds like a definition of the unconscious, this is because the reality of the unconscious is sexual. So my argument, I think, is that when you come to economics, when you come to all of these other things, the, the ways in which some of that operates is through um, appeals to unconscious responses that are somehow or another rooted in, in sex, in sexual responses. It's not that it explains everything, it's that, it's what I said before in response to the question about, um, uh, about how Trump succeeded. There are these appeals that are more than appeals to interest. How does an appeal to interest actually achieve its end? By um, manufacturing an enemy, a, a, a Polish worker who's gonna take your job away. Um, by um, playing on anxieties that people have about um, who they are and what uh, kinds of, of meaning they have. How, how do, that last question I said, you know, what is the erotic appeal of politics? What is the erotic appeal of, of anything? Uh, how is that working to help secure the, um, the end that a particular political or social or economic movement. It's not everything. I mean, I think capitalism is a force that we have to contend with. I don't think capitalism is, is, can be explained by references to sex, but the appeal of capitalism, its ability to engender certain kinds of subjectivities has something to do with unconscious appeals as well as conscious ones. And that's what I think I'm trying to, to argue in, in this, um, in what I said. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's the ego's job to keep track of time. <laughs> um, and it's time for us to continue this conversation in private. Thank you. Thank you.